Hi, I'm Mark Taylor, and it's time again for the Mark Taylor Show. This week's guest is Ian White. Welcome to the show, Ian. Hi, Mark. Ian uh, is living in St. George. Are you, you're not originally from St. George, or are you? I, no, I'm from Upper Canada. Right on. Uh, so, Ian, yeah. So, so, you know, I always do that because around here it, it gets a little bit of a okay. well, little we, bit we of could, response. Okay, well, that's all right. Uh, unfortunately, I guess the reason that Ian is on the show is I'm doing a part of uh, my series here on cancer. Ian's wife, Kim, lost the battle with cancer back in March of 2016. Uh, okay, we just rewind back a little bit, Ian. Uh, was there uh, any sign of illness in her, in her past before this came along? Um, you know, there was some history in her family. Her grandmother had uh, breast cancer. There was, um, Kim had been going through a, more of a naturopathic approach to her health care for the last number of years. She had some issues that she wasn't finding cures within the traditional medicines and through some uh, sports medicine went to a naturopath in Ontario and then when we moved here she found a, a naturopathic doctor who was working under a program called Halkunst. And so she, she'd been doing that for a number of years. And right. then in 2012, it was probably around February, we found a lump in her left breast. And uh, sorry, I'm wrong, her right breast. Okay. And uh, so we started the process of determining what that was and how, what the situation was, what we, what, uh, what we should do. And, and she continued on with her naturopathic programs and uh, followed through with some of the uh, conventional medicines. Okay, uh, I, I guess people that don't know Kim, she was a, a very active and fit lady, right? I mean, never, you know, biked and did lots of things, right? I mean, there was nothing that was out to stick out that she was, there was any unhealthiness, that's for sure. No, she was an athlete her whole life. She was yeah. a, a runner, she, uh, a long distance runner as well, at, you know, through high school and, and through her life. She, she was always active, did a lot of walk, walking as well. Uh, we were both, you know, as, as uh, teenagers active and continue to be active. Uh, when we moved out here, we, we got into cycling because, you know, your body gets older, doesn't like the running and the yep, pounding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, we were riding quite a bit and uh, we, did, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of activi activities. But yeah, she was a healthy, a healthy girl. She, she looked at her, her body as a, as a temple and she really did try to, I guess, understand what was going on. But she did have some aches and pains and she had some issues with running and was trying to uh, find out what the problems were. And through this uh, program, she did realize that she had some, some historical issues with uh, mercury. Uh, she grew up in Northern Ontario where the, the mining community was dumping um, you know, mercury into the water. So she was eating a lot of fish and she picked up that. So we, we did some attempts to, to clear that from her body as well. So there's a lot of things, but yes, yeah, overall very active, very, uh, very fit and uh, conscious of her, her well-being. And a, a very artistic lady, right? I mean, painter and things like that. I... She was a, a, an artist uh, right. uh, through and through. Um, watercolors originally. Um, she had uh, commissioned a couple of works that the uh, Queen of England has and uh, moved through and started getting into some writing and uh, other forms of art, but yes, very artistic and, and uh, great, uh, had, you know, found her place in the community here as well as back in Ontario. Um, but she, she loved languages too. I mean, she could speak four or five languages. Uh, she learned Finnish, she learned Russian. And uh, when Mary Craig sold her store, she actually started to learn some Korean with uh, the new owners. The, the new owners. So okay. She had, a, she, she had, she had that ability to, to pick up languages, and I think that's also part of the, the artistic side wow. for herself yeah. too. Um, I guess so. When you, she made the discovery of the lump, did she go to a doctor immediately, or is it a? Yeah, we, we, I mean, obviously here, like anything else, healthcare is kind of stretched, and but yep. we, did, we did get into the doctor, we went into the specialist, she went to two or three, um, you know, other, did the, the traditional mammograms and uh, had to have a biopsy, um, and we went to one of the doctors, you know, the, the main surgeon in, in uh, St. John, 
And literally at the 11th hour, after doing a lot of research, uh, thinking about herself, uh, her, her path, um, what, she was, what she had seen her grandmother go through and other people, um, she made a conscious decision that she didn't want to follow the traditional medicines. Um, and there's a point where you almost get on a freight train. Right. You go in, you find it, and all of a sudden, I think a lot of cancers nowadays, it's just bang, 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 bang. And, yep. you know, we went from a very quick discovery to, you know, having to have, a, a, you know, the, the breast removed, having lymph nodes removed. Um, so we did a bunch of other things. We did some personal stuff. We went to, uh, you know, we went, we went and had some PET scans, which take, uh, they're a little bit more uh, in-depth on cancers, when, you know, looking at heat and where cancer cells are. And even when we did that, there were a number of metastases already that had formed in her back. Um, on, and even though the, the lump in her breast was quite small, there were other areas within her body that ha had already started. So um, she decided she was going to take this traditional medicine uh, and not take the traditional medicine and, and work more through the, uh, the, the naturopathic stuff. And so that's kind of where we were and went that way for about two years. Okay. Did the doctors at the first tell you how aggressive it was or to give you an indication of a time frame that well, you had, I don't know, ahead of you? Uh, they were pretty, I guess the word would be vague. You okay. know, they, they don't really know. It's all independent. It depends on the treatments. But Kim did a lot of research and we did a lot of research together. Um, and, you know, sort of understood some of the numbers and how they worked. And um, again, it was a personal choice. She just, she didn't feel that she wanted to subject herself to the, the to that at the time. Um, right. Wanted to try some other things based on the information that we had and based on, you know, more than one consultation with a doctor. I mean, she, she did see other doctors. She did, she did talk to other people. And she had a, a network of, uh, of individuals around her that, you know, felt that, that she was getting some treatments right. outside of the, the standard uh, chemo and the uh, radiation treatments. Uh, initially, when I guess when it started, it didn't slow her down because I think you guys went on trips and, and, and things uh, like you went to Europe, I believe, did you not? Yeah, we traveled quite, we, we traveled a fair amount. I mean, we have kids throughout North America and uh, we decided to, you know, she was going to live her life, and we, right. we did live. There, we, we, you know, we did. We had a good life, and we, we uh, did a lot of things. We traveled. We, we kept cycling. Right. Um, everything was going along very, very well for about two and a half years. And, and even back to your first question, or one of your other questions. I mean, what the doctors did say is there wasn't a lot that they could pinpoint in time, but we did know that if she did the traditional chemo and the radiation and the, the operations, that she would have probably a year to year and a half of recovery. Right. Um, and you know, she really didn't want, you know, so year and a half, year and a half recovery, plus maybe you get an extra two, maybe three years out of, of the life based on what she had seen and where she was. Uh, she decided she wanted to have a quality of life rather than you know going through the the pain and the suffering it of knocks the heck out of you, right? I mean that's the the chemo yeah, and the, the it radiation. Yeah, it does. And it does, and and you know for the two and a half years we did our you know we we traveled, we 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 moved through our lives, we did what we had to do. She continued her her, her quest on, on a more personal uh, naturopathic uh, route. Halkins was a real interesting uh, program. There's some great people here in town. Uh, um, Allison McQuinn is the individual, and her and Kim worked exclusively together. And it wasn't just on her health, but it was also on her spirit, on her soul, on her her mind. You know, dealing with you know life issues and and things that Kim had had gone through her whole life. So, it was a really good program, and and uh, you know Kim got to a better place um, emotionally, spiritually, f and and I think it was it was good for her. Um, and it was the right choice. Um, so we we were you know doing our thing, and then uh, m our our daughter uh, was getting, or my daughter, Kim's stepdaughter, was getting married in Italy. So we we decided we, at the time we were cycling. So let's, let's plan a, a two week trip. We'll fly to Rome. We'll cycle up to Siena where the uh, wedding was over a week. Stay at some B and Bs. You know, cycle 100 100 k a day, and then go to the wedding for three or four days, and then cycle back to right. Rome. And as we got closer and closer to the trip was uh, May long weekend of 2000 and uh, I guess that would have been 15? 15 it would have been, yep. Um, she was getting a little weaker and having some other issues. 
and then on the trip over, we actually I had to stop in Toronto and go to the hospital, um, and that's where we determined that the cancer had progressed to a point where her walking was labored. She needed a cane. Um, she uh, it became apparent that the cancer was getting was was very aggressive, and it was at a point now where. We, went, we, we got over to the wedding, she struggled to get there, in, enjoyed the wedding as best we could, got right. home, came back to uh, New Brunswick, went to our, back to our doctors, and you know they said this is at a point now where we got on the freight train. Yep. And literally, you know, within a couple of weeks, we had five, six, five treatments of radiation in her, in her stomach area, around her back, the uh, steroids so it really got to a point where the quality of life just disappeared yeah, and yep. over the next five months she was really in a bad uh, she couldn't eat the radiation just r took her took her down to a point where she was I, I thought I was gonna lose her at that point right um, she was basically living on uh, cream soda Wow because that's all her all she, all she could she, she could take and okay. one minute she wanted an orange popsicle she tasted and she goes I don't like this it tastes like crap yeah okay <laughs> um, but we got through that we did a few things and um, and then she she was doing well um, but it was a tough go until probably September October uh, through that time the dot once once the the radiate or once the the, uh, the cancer um, we had some pictures taken and, and once we kind of understood where things were at the doctors were pretty good. I mean, they were, you know, here's the scenario. Right. Uh, they never said she's going to live six months. What they said was, we're surprised. You know, we, I would be surprised if she lives past a year. So I kind of said, well, okay, so. Is this telling just you or the both of you? Both of us. Okay. Okay. Um, what you got to understand, Mark, is Kim wasn't going to die. Right. Um, as a as a as her husband and as you know father to children that she ra she birthed and raised mine, we never had an opportunity to talk to her about her dying because she wasn't going to die. Right. And that was really hard for everybody. Um, so she was you know fighting to the end. She was a fighter and she was always looking for alternatives and she was always doing something, and uh, feel, you know she was a very positive individual. And always you know always saw the good in everything and the good in the people. So when, you know, with her not going to die, right. we never really had those conversations. She didn't really want to know. She didn't want to hear um, what other people thought. So even when we first found out that she was sick, it was a very tight group. Right. We didn't tell our kids. We didn't tell our parents. We didn't. Nobody knew. I I, I told a handful of people very close to me. Right. Um, even some of our best friends, we didn't tell. Um, because normally what happens is people get very negative or yep. they, they don't not maybe negative they try and be helpful but just their words and and yeah. words are powerful um, can and people people react different to you then as well and, and you like you know not saying a pity party would start or anything like that but that's probably not something that she wanted either right no she didn't want that she wanted she didn't you know and she was a close she was a you know fairly qu a close closed individual or you know she kept her her feelings close but it was her decision, and I, I had I had to abide by that. So it was right. hard for me, and and we really we didn't even tell our children until it was quite noticeable um, back when we were going to the uh, to the wedding that she had she was having issues. So right. you know our children had some challenges, um, but obviously you know when we decided to tell everybody, it was a different you know things changed. But yep. so. Well, it became apparent that you, you couldn't hide it anymore, right? Well, and we weren't hiding it. No, I'm not you were hiding it, but I'm just but saying it was out in the open, yeah. so there was really... It was out in the might, open, and, well I mean, you know, even even our my employer, you know, I, I told a, a few key people in the employer, uh, Kim was, a, you know, a very strong uh, Christian, and, and we had, uh, you know, a number of people praying for her, and, you know, she was, you know, seeking counsel through, through Christ, and so there was a lot of stuff like that that was going on, and, and just... The negative. She didn't want the negativity. Right. How, wherever it would come from. Yep. Um, so we 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 uh, we kept it close. Um, and once it was in the open, it was a little a little different. And there was it really rallied. The people in the area were amazing. Um, through you know even when she you know when she was uh, after radiation, you know people coming in and helping and uh, you know it was quite it was quite good. It was, it was when, you, when we were you were talking about the alternative methods, would this be? Like a supplements, or a, like were there certain foods you'd have to eat, or how? Um, yeah, there was organic stuff, or what, what was that entail? Well, the the naturopathic side had supplements and different things, but right. the the Hawkins program is a little different. I'm not going to get into the the, the gist no, no. of it, but yep. it was there. There were um, 
it's all about energy. So there were supplements, and there were you know certain energies that were given through different uh, different supplements, uh, as well as as some emotional work that was going on. Um, she also, I, I bought a small car, and it sits on my counter basically. Uh, it's a juicing machine, and uh, it's called a uh, Norwalk. Um, it's a, it's it's quite expensive. Okay. <laughs> But it's used to make uh, juices, right. and uh, so once she got off the, the cream soda, she actually got into a, a, a program for cancer treatment using organic uh, foods and, and juices, and, and basically getting you know putting her body through that. So uh, as she was doing that, the nurses and the doctors that were calling on her were amazed at how well she looked and how how she was physically. Right. But the cancer was still there, and, and so she was, you know, battling it through that, that uh, those methods as well. So it was, it was, it was, it was very interesting, very, very time-consuming, very costly buying organic food all the time when yep. you're, you know, you're using five, uh, probably you're using close to, uh, ten, ten heads of romaine lettuce a day. Wow. Plus two bags of carrots, plus apples. So is it, kind of, I, I guess, put it in like a layman's term, would it be kind of like a V8 juice, that we wouldn't call like something along that line? Yeah, something like that. But it, it would be, be yeah. obviously homemade. But. Yeah, and the machine that was we used was to, to extract the most nutrients possible without de destroying the actual product. And right. So, anyways, I use it today. I mean, it makes such a good drink. I use it today, and it does, yeah. a, does a bunch of other stuff. But yeah, it's, well, it's, yeah. I got a small car on my, my counter, so I better use it. I guess. <laughs> um, I, I, um, you mentioned that you called it a freight train. I have, I haven't gone through it myself. I found it to be a roller coaster as well. Like there's days where people will tell you, you, you know, they'll ask you how it's Kim doing. You'll say, oh, she's not doing very good today. And then there's next day, it's 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 different. So did you find that? That's a, yeah, I mean, it w I travel for work too. And I was right? lucky that I could sort of scale back my travel. Um, but yeah, I mean, she had great days, and then she had some other days that weren't weren't very good. Um, and we, you know, it was good for my family because our our daughter, after Kim was was sick and she did the radiation, she really fell fast. Yep. Um, and got to a point where she could not, she couldn't, you know, she couldn't look after herself. So uh, our daughter moved in from Toronto for uh, and came came to live with us um, and helped out because I because of my work. And uh, our other daughter was was still here from school, so it was nice to have that support. And um, with um, you know the healthcare system, you know obviously um, extramural Extra, was, was, say, was huge. Come, yeah, you know they came around a lot. And uh, through her illness, now at the end they were even they were even more amazing uh, how well they came because we you know Kim stayed in the house for. Uh, you know, right, well, not to the right to the end, but, you know, pretty much, you know, two weeks before she passed, and then she went to Bobby's hospice. You build up almost uh, a personal rapport with these people, the, the extramural, right? I mean, they would come yeah. to your house, and they become not only uh, caregivers, but almost like a friends, I guess. And, and we it's actually... It's a relationship you may, still, you may still run into the people from time to time. Yeah, one, one, one of the ladies I'm still, I still see regularly, and we have contact with regularly. Um, on the extramural team, and there was a number of them. Um, different, you know, the the physios, and then there's the, uh, you know, obviously the doctor, and then the nurses, and so there was quite a few that came, and and people helping with, you know, making sure that the house was was compatible. And I mean, Kim couldn't walk stairs, and right. and uh, we'd actually put a bedroom downstairs for uh, to to do some uh, Airbnb. Well, right. We, we never got to do that because Kim moved into that room exactly. as myself. So. But you know, I I put a shower in the house in the in on the main floor so she could shower and have quality of life in that respect. And right. you know, we had beds that we had that we put outside that she could lay outside and enjoy the the weather and during the summer rather than just staying in a in a room all the time. So, but the extramural team was 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 excellent. Our neighbors were were phenomenal. Our our uh, my my work colleagues. You know, yeah. I, I probably put on 30 pounds because there was food coming every day. Yeah. I couldn't throw it out. No, no, you don't you know, want to be wasteful. So, Waste not one night. Know. And uh, so it was, it was good that way. It was, it was really the support in the local community was amazing. So it becomes, there, there becomes a time, or there comes a time, I should say, that when you become, you go from battling to just making her comfortable. And, that, and, and when you, you reach that point, you, both, you must have both knew, right? This is where we're at now. Well, as I said, Kim was never going to die. No, that's right. So, you know, she was always optimis optimistic. She wanted to build greenhouses. She wanted to do things in the garden. Um, 
you know, there was always something that she was going to do and we were going to do. So the hardest part for, for the family was dealing with that part. And um, so it's a little different than probably most people, but, right. you know, she was, she was a fighter to the end. Uh, but it got to a point where the caregivers were, more, were, were actually very instrumental in, in making her understand where things were headed. Um, as well as for myself, the, the the extramural team, they were extremely, you know, like, okay, this is the signs, this is what's going to happen. I was actually in Scotland when uh, Kim had a had a turn for the worst, and I had to try and get home early, and I couldn't. There was no way I could do it; just the flights didn't work. And you know, a couple of people from the community stayed with her and helped yep. her, and there was a power outage that one weekend, and. And basically, from that point on, uh, the the extramural team said, "Okay, here's where you're at." And I've never experienced the passing of, of anybody. I've never lived it, so I right. had no idea what to expect. And, right. And just their 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 understanding of what I needed to know and and that I was good. They they told me straight up. They gave me options. They you know helped us make decisions that could make Kim's care more comfortable, as well as understand that we're family and having someone in your home that you're caring for 24 seven and you know, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed, you just, there's, I look back on it today and I don't, re I don't understand how I did it. Like right, how, no. I, how I did it for as long as I did yep. over a year. Um, and so, you know, it was nice that when the opportunity came for Kim to, when she was kind of near the end and she was having a hard time, that a, a, a bed came available at Bobby's Hospice. And That's where um, I was going to go. I, I was gonna, you had you had extreme kudos for those guys. I mean, there's they were over the they were amazing. I mean, between the the which is in St. Team, John, in case there's people yeah, out there that know. Yeah, so Bobby's yep. Hospice is a uh, is a uh, end of life care center in in St. John. It's funded, you know, 50 percent by the government, 50 percent by uh, by donations and the team there was was amazing um, you know they they looked after after Kim as much as they looked after us as well the family uh, having in the uh, the extramural team Miranda was her name um, she uh, you know she said to me like Ian you know you can't be a caregiver and you it's you know you need to be a, a you need to be a husband so you know and I said well Kim doesn't want to go and I said well let me talk to her and figure out what what's best and and that's really what, what where where they were, were really really good is that it allowed the family to be a family through the time when she you know wasn't you know we didn't have to look after you could sit right. and talk to her and not worry about having to get a help her get up to go to the bathroom right or okay. something like that so um, it was it was it was very uh, it was a good a good transition and um, so uh, was, was she taking things uh, for pain, was there? Did they give her stuff for, to keep her pain down at the end? At, oh yeah, I mean because that, they have to make you comfortable. I mean, you just can't stand there and writhe in pain. It's yeah, no, they they were really um, they were quite quite good at, at you know with uh, with with the right medication at the right times uh, and explaining what those were doing and why they were there and and what I could expect and uh, so yeah, it was it was an experience, Mark, that you. Unless you've been through it, it's, no. you, it's it's really hard to explain right. how the passing of something. And it may be different for different types of illnesses, and and uh, you know. But what they explained to me happened, uh, so I was prepared, and um, I kind of knew um, when it was near. Well, when it was near the end, I mean, I I woke up on uh, Saturday morning. Just I was you know staying up at, at the hospice. The kids were lucky. I'd, I'd already planned to have the kids come home, um, so they were they were home, <clears throat> and it just happened that the bed came open. So, but when the kids all got home from B Edmonton, Ontario, and and Moncton, when they got home, there was Kim was already at the hospice. So we didn't have to. They, they saw her mother, their mother there, right? And um, they were home for a week, um, and then sh so they saw their mother. They you know they got a chance to say goodbye. And uh, and then they they but because Kim was going to survive, right? She uh, they left, you know, knowing thinking that mom's going to get well, not thinking, but I mean, yep. in their eyes, mom's going to get better and she's yep. going to go home. And and I, you know, I was kind of like, well, defy me, you know, like Kim, just defy that you're you're going to, you know, that you're not going to pass away yep. and you're going to go home. And 
know, prove me wrong. Right. right? That's kind of one of those things. And she, uh, so we were, the last week she was there and um, they were, you know, they, they explained what was going to happen. They gave me, they, they, they were really good that way. And, and they, they made her comfortable, you know, they, they made her comfortable with what, what was available. So, but I knew. I woke up yeah. on Saturday morning, uh, went into the room. She had, had, she basically had been non-responsive for about two days. Okay. And as they said, once the body doesn't, can't take any, f any more food, it just shuts down. Your body basically has X amount of days to survive. And, okay. uh, so I went into the room and for some reason I just started, pa I packed her stuff up. Yeah. Wow. I just knew, and I so I packed her, her, her clothes. I took what she, what I needed, you know, as easy as possible, and then literally, just uh, right around the spring solstice or spring. Yeah, it was, it was the first day of spring, I believe. Yeah, she 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 died. She passed away literally within about a half an hour of the spring solstice. Wow. Um, and that's pretty much Kim. I mean, yeah. being a, I mean, if she was born in the '60s, she'd be a hippie. Right. You know, she'd be a yep. tree hugger. And if uh, if if I didn't work in the, the the business that I work in, she'd probably be one of those NGOs that would make my life miserable. <laughs> um, but you know she she was a she was an earth earth, earth girl and, and I think the uh, the timing was perfect like for yeah. her to uh, you know to, to to pass the day of you know the spring solstice was pretty much right it's, it's like a rebirth yep. for her and and I know that uh, for her you know going to see her Lord and being with you know be, with with uh, with Christ is was was exactly what's going to happen right um, so. It was six months ago. Yep. It seems like it was I know. a long I know. time and, ago. And I, and, and I hesitated about asking you because I know the, the it's it's the wound is still open, and I and I wasn't sure if it was time, but you assured me that you could. And I, I you know you, you've been well. a, a great guest. I, I have got one question for you: is what ad, what advice do you have for somebody out there who is either going through themselves or has a loved one? I guess the only thing that I I would want to, if I could do it again, or you know, I think we talked about regrets, and I don't I don't call it regrets, but if I could do it again, I would really want to make sure the person who is who I am with, I'm listening to them, and I'm right. really really understanding what they're going through and what they're feeling. Yep. Kim was a writer, and in the last six months, I knew she was writing, but they were private, so. I've come across them. I've read read a lot of her stuff in the last few months, and you know, I see a book lying around. I will pick it up and read it. And I don't think we truly underst understand what despair they're going through, the fears that they have, the loss that they're going to have, the fact that they're right. not going to see their grandchildren or their their kids again, or their husbands and or their wives. I guess yeah. it's. And I think that as as a caregiver, at times we we get caught up in that. Caregiving, we don't, you know, we don't remember that this was my 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 life partner. Right. This is my spouse. This is the the girl I fell in love with in high school, walking down a track that I married, yep. and had, you know. So those are the things that that if I could actually sit at the side of the bed and say, tell me your fears, tell me tell me your your what like what are you feeling, yep. and actually listen. That's yep. the hardest part, because yep. it's that. That's and I wish I did, because I've read through some of the stuff and I was really shocked at how much pain she was. Exp not pain, physical pain, but just uh, the emotional sort of desire for you know life and to live that she knew she was not going to be able to do at a certain point. Yeah, you know, and I, and I guess that's that's part of it. Is that today I'm a, you know we're all alive today. Uh, yeah, live every moment. Um, you know, I enjoy the small things when I walk walk around our house and uh, things that she did and things that that you know I'm having to do now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and when you travel as much as I do, uh, you know, just even having the the, the lawn cut or knowing that the driveway is going to get plowed or you know my my laundry is going to get done exactly it's 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 those small things that uh, you know or just sitting on a chair you know on a sunday morning having a coffee talking about what what you want to do in your life yeah. and, and what your dreams and goals are even though you're 50 years old where you know where you want to go on your next holiday what you want to do with your children I told you this was going to go by in a flash. Really appreciate you coming on in. It's been a great show, and I'm sure the viewers will, uh, be, will really enjoy it. That's another episode of The Mark Taylor Show. Please join in next time.